right. We were finally ready. All right. So, so I'm going to talk more about tables and census data. Uh, no particular announcements aside from, you know, uh, like I said, I actually probably should have put on here. Make sure you look at that Piazza post. There is an easy cut and paste error. Uh, thanks to uh, somebody who came by my office to ask me about it. Um, and so it's, but it's very easy to fix, but you have to do it before you launch uh, your instance. But then it'll stick after that. All right, so we basically go immediately into a demo uh, or into um, a Jupyter notebook, which I'm going to put over there. Oops. <laughs> I can hide this thing. Yeah. All right. So the first thing we do is we run the opening cell to make sure that our uh, you know various tools are imported. Uh, let me open my uh, cheat sheet so that I know what I'm talking about. Which, because it's that kind of day, it's going to take forever to chunk to chunk. Okay, exactly. I, I probably need to reboot or something. I I know it's working because I can see it over there. There we go. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a table from scratch. Um, but in order to do that, we need, and I talked about this last lecture. Does anybody know what do we need to be able to uh, create a table from scratch? Anybody remember? Well, this isn't necessarily the only way, but the way we're going to do it is we're going to make an array first. Um, and to make it semi topical, we will make an array of various buildings at BU. All right. And so all I do is just give a name or a variable, and we call make array, which is coming off of that data science library. So if I hadn't run this, this would throw an error. And then I name I take some of the places. Actually, it's kind of BU campus in general, right? So we have pavement, coffee shop, MLK Memorial, uh, Questrom, Platonics Lab. Uh, and uh, if you haven't been to those places, you should go. Um, and then what we do is we can just kind of declare a table, but that's not very interesting, right? Because there's nothing in that table. Okay. But what we did there is we said, Give me a new table with nothing in it. Okay. And then we didn't assign it to anything, so it also immediately goes away. So, not a very useful statement, but it gives the idea. So, what we can do is let's make a table called campus. And there's a spot on the screen, so it looks like I'm typing it incorrectly when I'm actually doing it right. But now, what we do is we do with column and if you notice, I hit control space, and that's how I get the completion. So I don't have to type everything, and more importantly, so I don't make mistakes. And what's funny is that as you start to become a programmer, um, you will start hitting control space when you're writing a text document, when you're writing an email, all the time, because you're like, why are you figuring this out yet? Um, so it's like autocorrect with way less failure. And then, we are going to give it two things here. We're going to give it the, the label, right? The name of the column. And we're going to give it whatever data is going to go in that. And then we get it instantly a new table, but we'll display it because that first one is just an assignment statement. And now we see we have a table that has those four elements. So another very interesting table, but you get the idea. But now I'm going to cheat a little bit by using the a range function that we talked about before. So 
what I'm going to say is give me another column called blocks from Marsh Plaza. And we're going to say, you know what? I'm not actually going to figure it out. I'm just going to say zero, one, two, three blocks. And probably it's close. So might have been the, the guy who designed the list of uh, campus locations. May have done it on purpose. That being me, of course. And now we have two columns in our awesome table. Um, and so we're saying the question is, is zero blocks away, but now we have two columns. It's getting slightly more interesting. Then, whoop, sorry, I, I scrolled in the wrong place, but now I can't find the mouse at all. All right, but then we can find out certain things about the table because so so one of the things if you remember from let's say the first lecture might have been the second lecture I can never remember where you know one of the things that we want to do when we're kind of first are presented with uh, you know a, a set of data is try to like explore the data and so one of the, these are, what are some kind of convenient things that will tell you a little bit about the table once you've loaded it. So one thing we can do is ask the labels in that. Um, and if you notice, anything, anybody notice kind of what's wrong here? Why is this only one column? Yeah. You never assigned the campus with column by campus. Right. So let's do that real quick. But I'm going to cut and paste to make it easier for me. I know it makes it harder for y'all to follow along, but oops, still didn't do it. And now we have both columns, so we get both column labels. Um, but then we can also do things, especially when we have a lot, um, which might be a better start, is we can, oh my goodness, num columns. And we can just say, okay, well, how many columns are there? Just to get an idea. Um, we can do the exact same kind of thing with how big the table is. And obviously, in my little arbitrary hand built example, this is not terribly interesting, but you get the idea, right? So we want to know a little bit about the table. How big is it? How many rows, right? How wide is it? How many columns? Um, and we can actually get the column labels if we want them. Um, and the kind of models definitely comes in handy as you get uh, into more sophisticated programming as well. Um, let me just. Uh, sorry, I wanted to see what the next slide was. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually get a table from a file, okay? And so uh, you may not have any experience with this, but so in Windows, they used to hide this a lot, so it may not be as obvious. On a Mac, it tends to be more It's more like Linux, okay? This is usually the file name, right? And this is usually referred to as the extension. The extension usually indicates the file is. In this case, it's a CSV, which is short for comma separated values. So, in other words, there's a file called devoir.csv that its format is it's basically rows and columns, but each of the elements is separated by commas. And that's why it's called a CSV. So, it gives us a hint about what it is. Does anybody know any other extensions that they see all the time? EXE, which is definitely a Windows thing. You don't see that on Linux or Mac. SH, which you only see on Linux and Mac, um, which is, so EXE is executable. SH is short for shell script. Uh, any others? Right, so the good one for this right, is IPYNB, which indicates a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the reason it's IPYNB is because Jupyter Notebook used to be called IPython Notebooks. Um, and so it's I P Y, right? And the um, let's see, somebody had one over here. Yeah. 
done it before, right? So, uh, you know, basically music or, uh, you know, coming from an open source background, I prefer .org, but, you know. So that's what we're doing here, and we can load it and then print it. And, you know, this is still a pretty small table, um, but, you know, we have a bunch of columns and then a bunch of rows. Um, and, you know, you should all have this CSV. You should be able to copy along. Um, and if you look at that CSV file, you'll see it's literally, actually, maybe I'll just show it real quick because I think it makes more sense that way. <laughs> nope. Oh, my goodness, today. All right. All right. So what we can see is we can actually see. Actually, let me do it this way. Um, And as you can see, it really is just exactly that, right? So it's just a bunch. Of, so if you notice, it's got the column labels, right? Those are also separated by commas, and then all the data is separated by commas. Um, so one of the things you have to be cautious of, right, is if your data has commas, that's going to go poorly, right? So what you normally do is surround whatever it is with quotes uh, to avoid that problem. Most of these are very simplistic, so as a result, they they don't have quotes around them, but you will see quotes in there to indicate that there's commas in the data, as you might imagine. All right, so back to our notebook for a minute. And actually, we're going to stop there and go back to the slides. So we you know, saw a couple things, right? So read table and creating an empty table. An empty table, you can add columns generally speaking you, like when you're doing these if you want to build it from scratch it's probably easier just to add columns but you can also add rows okay as you go along um you can get a little bit of analysis of it right you can say num rows num columns you can look for all the labels um, but then you can do all your select where sort and etc on those on the table you created um either because you pulled it out of a file or you did by hand but then whenever you operate on it it will create new tables which you saw me do when I reassigned the campus um, table to have the new problem. All right. Can't seem to find my mouse today. I need a bigger uh, pointer. And here I have a question. Uh, if you want to read a table named sleep times, how would you code this argument? Uh, no file extension. So yeah, normally there would be a file extension here. Uh, you know, typo. Oh, this is also one thing that I, I struggle with. So um, I had some very mean English teachers in like high school. Uh, so my grammar is very, very particular about certain things. And one of them is, does a comma belong inside the quotes or outside the quotes? And this is actually culturally different. In the US, it's usually inside the quotes. In most of Europe, it's outside the quotes. However, if you are a programmer, you will promptly start to move them outside the quotes so that people don't think that the comma belongs in whatever that string is, right? Does that make sense? So think about that when you're typing, because I know my fingers will automatically put the comma inside the quote. Um, and then I have to go back and manually change it when I'm writing code or whatever. All right, we need a few more answers. What else we got? And remember, it's, quite, it's certainly anonymous in the classroom. These are not like graded things. So, um, you know, take a shot at it. See what you think. Yeah. 
All right, so we're going to move. Theoretically. All right, so we have a lot of mixed answers there. Okay, so um, this. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out the differences here. Um, okay, so can anyone tell me what is wrong with this one up here? So, yeah, so there's no quotes around this. So it's looking for like a name thing called sleep underscore times, which is obviously you're going to likely throw an error unless we made sleep underscore times a string inside that name, right? Then what about this one? Is this one correct or incorrect? Anyone? So this one, oops, not that one, this one, and this one are both correct. Okay. Remember how I said, as long as the quotes match and there's nothing inside it that is the other kind of quote, right, that would break it up, either one is totally fine. So both of those are correct. Hopefully they're marked that way. All right, here's another one for you. So, if you're making a table from scratch and you have columns in mind already, what would you write to add those columns? Or what, uh, basically, it's, it's like which, you know, which of these is the right kind of function to call? Not necessarily what the columns are. I wish it showed me somewhere how much time had elapsed. All right, I'm gonna close it there. Uh, we did pretty well on that one. Um, so with columns is the correct answer here, okay? Um, and uh, is this how you create or add columns to a, a table that you wanna create? Cool. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about a story. All right, has anybody ever heard of W.E.B. Du Bois? Can you tell me who he is? No, a little bit. Like you heard the name? Yes, but that's not that's not the most interesting thing about him. Um, but he uh, often considered one of the founders of data science, um, and uh, unusually was a person of color uh, doing this kind of work, um, and specifically trying to help others uh, who were you know also people of color. Um, he actually founded the NAACP. Uh, does anybody know what the NAACP is? All right, I'm not going to ask you to expand the term because it's a word we don't typically use anymore. Um, but it is an organization uh, for uh, generally, I think pretty much it is black people, let's say, but it could be uh, people of color in general. But I think it's mostly black people. It certainly was originally. Um, but it's basically an adv advocacy group. Um, so he was a scholar, a historian, an activist, and a data scientist. Um, but this organization is, is present today and still does really good work. Um, and then made a series of visualizations, which is what we're kind of going to talk about and his data science stuff, obviously, uh, for the Paris Exposition. Um, and with the hope of if putting kind of in, uh, so one of the things we often talk about in data science is the difference between data and information, okay? Does anybody have a theory about what I would mean by the difference between those two words, which are commonly syn synonyms? Um, my best guess would be that data without a model is kind of you know, all over the place, or so information might be more structured. Yeah, so it, it, it's essentially correct. You don't need to necessarily say model, but you know, data is a big table, right? Information is something that you can like extract, right? It's something that you can understand about it. Um, and so he was trying to show data in such a way that the information would hopefully change the way people saw black. Um, 
he, he did 100 photographs, but it also has a number of patents. Um, and then the really impressive part, and I think this is the loss of anybody who doesn't like like to draw, essentially, um, but he made a ton of graphs by hand, right? So that are accurate by hand. You know, I have a trouble drawing a, a straight line or a circle, right? But actually drawing something like a graph is, is pretty impressive. So this is the one we're going to talk about. Um, and I zoom in a bit in places in a minute. Um, because I know it's because uh, it's so faded, it's quite hard to see. Um, but the idea here is that he's trying to show if you're in this income range or 102, I think it's $102 to $100, maybe. Um, and then this is how your money is spent, okay? And the colors correspond with this black color. So I think my next slide shows this a little bit bigger. Yeah. So where you see black is what you spend on rent, um, you know, and this purpley blue color is food, um, and then clothing is the pink orangeish color, and then taxes is that gray, and then other is you know kind of everything else you spend money on. And so what he's trying to show, right, is actually let's talk about it a little bit more because what I did was I blew up some of the individual pieces. So class, which is not a word we would use for this normally anymore. So think like income bracket, okay, is what he means there. Um, and then he not only has the number of the range, but then actually the average for the people in the range. Why do you think it's important to include both of those numbers? Any ideas? You can actually tell if you look at the numbers. Why, why it's important to have that second piece of data. Because you can tell like what side it might be skewed towards. Right, right. So if like what you would expect just seeing this, right, is that the average is 250, yeah. right? But it's not, well, this case is it's pretty close. It's 248, right? Uh, but you know, this one is 433, 335. Um, you know, this one I think is interesting because it's 750 to 1,000 and the, and the average is 880. So, when we're exploring this kind of data, we, we kind of need to look a little bit beyond the obvious, okay? Um, so going back to the original version of it, uh, you know, let me just see what my next slide is. Um, so any, any conclusions that you might be able to draw from this? What do you think is interesting here? There's an income bracket to stop paying rent. Right. Right. So they went and bought a house, right? So, but what does that mean? What is it? What does that do for them? Like, what what might change about their life? Right. Things like education, right? Now they have significantly more, right? This is fifty percent of their already larger income versus nine or ten percent of their. Of a much smaller income that they can spend on continuing that upward growth in a sense. Right? So it's really important to see what's going on there. Um, what I think is interesting too, and this I think is a little bit reflection of the time, is um, the percentage spent on like food uh, also changes quite a lot uh, because, and this is one of those things where has anyone ever heard of trickle down theory? All right, so trickle down theory is this idea that if you pay rich people a lot, right, they will spend a lot of money on corporations, which will then create jobs and the money will trickle down, is the idea. But as you can see here, it may be not, right? Because, like in the food industry, they're not spending the same 43% of their income on food. So they're not growing this portion in kind of the same way. So, yes, they're spending an actual larger amount of dollars, but it's a smaller percentage of their income. Because at the end of the day, you can only eat so much food, right? So there's some there's some interesting economic theory there that you should go take an economics class to go learn more about that. But I uh, I smatter in a lot of things. All right, so, so that's the where, and I just showed you the table, which is basically this data. And so we're going to talk about those, uh, that data, uh, with the notebook in a second, but now we get another question, I think.
oh no, something went wrong. It says, great, what am I supposed to do about something going wrong? I mean, that's lovely. I think I'm gonna have to. But I assume it's gonna reload poorly. I think I missed the button. Uh, you already told me that. All right, let me see if I can just skip it. All right, I'm giving it one more try. What do you think? Cross your fingers. No. I think it's the it's a question that's more complex than some of the others. Uh, so let me reset it, and we'll do it the way I have done it before. All right, so that's where we'll go next. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to ask a question. All right, so what I wanna know is, I'll try to keep the table there too, but also make it so you can read it. So glancing at this data, you can answer this question, I assume, right? Or at least pretty briefly. What I want to know is, can you tell me a way in Python or in the notebook that I can get who spent the highest percentage on rent by class? All right. So this is partially why you're following along. So you can actually type in what you think might give you the answer. Uh, and then we'll give you, you know, 10 seconds or something to do that. Uh, we're, what we were hoping to be able to do was that I was going to do that in uh, Top hat, and you could I could actually show your answer. Um, but failure. So ideas. All right. Somebody beside you. Let's see. Who else? Somebody over there. I haven't talked to that part of the room. Can we over there? Give it a little bit higher. Okay, so that's the answer. What I'm looking for is what's the What's the code I would use to get that answer? I think it's the answer. Yeah. All right, anybody else have any ideas what the code should be? You think you know? Is it similar to the sort method? Yeah, so one way to do it would be to sort for the highest, uh, you know, the highest one. Um, and then the first one, right? But we don't need to get all that specific about it. But imagine this, you know, imagine this being 10,000 rows, right? We don't want to scan it. So what we can do is just sort it. So we can do, uh, and I'm trying to remember what the syntax is. And oops, I did by class, which was not the correct question. And so now we have it sorted by rent. Um, and oh, I forgot, I should have done uh, uh, descending equals true. Yeah. It is, and it drives me nutter on a regular basis. Um, so yes, all of the label names are case, space, character, everything sensitive. Okay, so it needs to be exactly the same. That was actually kind of why I re was referencing the labels earlier, because when I'm doing this myself, I will often print column labels and then use that to cut and paste from. 
so that I don't have to mess up the typing all the time over and over. So uh, the bottom of this table, I should have done descending equals true, um, is the highest rent percentage uh, amongst this group. All right, so then, We can start to do some other interesting things with the data where we can say, okay, let's take a look at, we just want to look at this status, for example, okay? And these are uh, labels Dubois made up kind of about the class, right, or the income brackets. And so he characterized some of them as poor and some fair and some comfortable. Um, and so we just extracted that data from the table because we wanted to you know look at those individually um, but then we can start to do other things where because i said that's actually it kind of is so this is kind of showing the select um, as a table but then we can also get it as an array to kind of reverse what we did before in case we wanted to say you know make a new table using that status somehow right um and then we get a couple of things here right we we notice that it's an array um you don't have to worry about this b type that's uh, the character type it is which you don't have to worry about too much um but it comes it basically comes into play when you're dealing with languages that are not based on what's your character set euro indian no uh something like that i'm blanking but basically english french you know as soon as you get into um many of the like Asian languages, stuff like that, the uh, the character set has to be bigger to be able to fit all the pictograms. Um, Indo-European. That's it. All right. So then we can get the column. And continuing on, we can also, you know, but we, we're not limited to strings, so we can also do it with the food. Um, and look at that. And then we can also start to do things that are a little bit more interesting by, let's say we want to know how much in dollars the average person spends in the group or in a given group, okay? So the way we do that is we would, from a math perspective, we would take the average and multiply it by the percentage of the food um, and so we can do that because, as you hopefully remember from last time, if we have an array, right, and another array, and we do an operation on them, as long as they have the same number of elements, it'll give us a result that is the result of the operation. So, and this is important because it's going to come up a lot, right? This is the kind of thing you expect to want to be able to do against your data is regularly be able to calculate new columns, right? So does anybody know? So what could I do now is let's do the same thing, but we're going to actually give it, we're going to actually assign a name to it. All right, so now we have something called food dollars. And we can put it directly in our table, right? Because now we have another array that has this, the data we want in it, but we, give, we have to give it a name. So we're going to call it food dollar. And then we're going to add food. I don't know why that didn't autocomplete for me. Um, so now we took that calculation and we put it in the right place in the table so that now we can just, you know, because that's that computed data, maybe we're using that for something else. Um, and that gets, you know, it can be interesting. All right. So let's see. Um, I already demonstrated the next thing. So now I'm going to actually add it, right? Because we have the same problem we did before is that I didn't actually reassign it like I did with the campus before. Um, but I need a new cell. All right. So now we actually have, 
the Du Bois ta table um, actually has the food dollars in it as a column on its own. However, what we can also do is do some niceties, but this is kind of the stuff where exercise for the interested, right? So we're not gonna probably test you on this, but we can actually set the format of certain data elements so that it looks right. Um, so now if we see, if we set the format of the food column to the percent formatter, it'll actually make it into a percentage okay, rather than just a raw number, which going back to that data versus information thing, now there's information there, right? In the sense that you don't have to know as much about the table itself to know that it's percentage. Because if you just saw that, right, it's not actually indicated anywhere what this 0 0.19 is. I think an educated guess is that it's a percentage because oddly enough, right, you add up to about 100. But if we put a percent sign in there, it makes it easier to understand. All right. And that's what I wanted to cover there. Let me go back to the slides. Not the broken slides. All right. So the next thing I want to mention is attributes. Okay. So actually, let me just show this real quick. This is an attribute of this row. Okay. So here we have the label, here we have the row, right? And so any given cross is an attribute. Does that make sense? So again, this is kind of terminology that's important. Um, especially because we think about attributes that are numerical versus some other things that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and they, and, and the whole set of attributes, so like any given column, should have the same type or be comparable somehow, right? So that we can think about them in terms of, you know, how, what are their differences, you know, what's their relationship, you know, a minimum, a maximum, you know, those kinds of things when we talk about numerical. But they're ordered, right? So in other words, like you can sort them in order, like we did with the percents, um, or sorry, with the, uh, the you know average uh, percent on food and then the differences between them are meaningful all right the other kind of attribute is one that's called categorical okay and a categorical is just basically everything else right so it's not a number likely it's some kind of string it's some kind of label and so this is where we have like uh the poor versus well-to-do column um, they may or may not have an order. That particular example does. Uh, you can imagine with the ice cream cones, for example, the different flavors of ice cream. Not, there's no order. And of course, chocolate is chocolate, and so they're for the best. But otherwise, it doesn't have an order. Um, and the categories are the same or different, um, but the point is they should be the same type. And then they, they should have a relationship to each other. Okay. That relationship may not be an ordering, but it should have like mean something, right? Um, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, the, the poor versus well to do, right? You shouldn't be putting, you know, the word poor on, on you know, somebody who's at the top of the income bracket um, because they should mean something. Or worse, right? It shouldn't be arbitrary. All right, now this is where it starts to get a little confusing, which is that just because it's a number doesn't necessarily mean it's a numerical attribute, okay? And so here's some examples. Um, so this is a very common one. You know, gender is often marked as a number because uh, like for a couple of reasons, um, primarily because it's, it's a lot of characters. 
And so, and it's like on every data set about people. Uh, and so just to make it shorter and take up a little bit less room, uh, it'd be nice if there was some consistency to it, but I am unaware of any. Uh, so, you know, you kind of have to look at that data set. Um, but then this is where it gets pretty messy, right? Is that if you try to do a mathematical operation on them, it really goes sideways. Um, and then, yeah, and so basically it's just, just because the number doesn't make it a numerical attribute, uh, it could be categorical, just it's, it's representing something else. Um, and in the old days, uh, you know, when uh, space was at a premium, it was a lot more important to try to make them as small as possible. You know, when you're talking about census data, right, that's a lot of data. So everything you can do to shrink it down, the better. Because if you really care what, you know, zero, one, and two expand to be, you can do that for like a subset of the data that you care about for that particular problem. But most of the time, you don't care. It's enough information to know that, you know, if you want to select, and I think in the census data, if you want to select all the males from the sample set, you select for all the ones, right? Um, there's this thing called... Uh, some ever heard of ICD? Uh, I think the current one is twelve. So, is anybody? If you've ever gone to the doctor and had to get insurance to cover it, uh, every time they file the paperwork, they have to apply a code to it, um, and those codes are like I want to say they're five or six different characters, but they indicate whatever it is that the doctor said you had, right? Um, and they're called. There's a whole like dictionary of them and they're called i can't remember what icd stands for anymore um but i think they're up to 12 when i worked on it, it was icd 9 but every like so often it keeps growing getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so there's you know you have all these encodings so it's nice when there's a few and you can just kind of remember what the differences are um but in a lot of data sets uh, it actually just they're huge and you have to go have a separate lookup table to go figure out how to you know interpret it so let me just see. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the data selection. And so we're going to load another database, or another table. Uh, and this one is basically performance of movies um, by year. And so this is a little weird, right? In that, um, you know, so it's only in this year how much Avengers made was the total gross was, um, I think this is in millions. So uh, uh, 11 billion, no, that's all right. So 70 thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands. So 11 million, that also looks all right. So maybe it's in, it's in millions. Um, average ticket price, and then the number of movies. Um, so maybe the number of movie houses uh, is, is the idea. Um, and then, but you kind of have a bunch of data about this, you know, sector. And maybe what we want to know is, Let's see. Yeah, I think it was millions. Um, so what we can do is we can now start to calculate against it, right? And we can actually say, hey, you know, I want to know what that number looks like a little bit more for real. And let's actually display it. Right, and so now it's kind of put it in terms of uh, scientific education, but now we get a better idea of what, what, what those numbers actually are. Uh, you know, kind of going back to that same formatting problem that we had before. Uh, it's just been all around in a complicated day. Now I'm getting battery warnings. All right, hopefully that'll help. Um, but then we can also say, Oh, 
Let's do it down here. So what is this going to give us? Anyway? Any ideas? So if we take the total number in dollars and divide it by the ticket price, what's that going to give us? The number of tickets that are actually sold for that particular movie in that particular year. Um, the reason it's weird is right is because a movie may be released and then actually cross years, right? You know, if it's released on December 25th, which a lot of big movies are, um, you know, it'll actually cross in January and so it gets a lot. But the idea here is just that we can now start to take those columns and, and work with them in different ways so that we can get new information that we want to add to our old table. So now we actually have uh, you know those tickets sold directly as its own column. And there it is showing up on the end. Uh, not a very useful number because it's pure it's scientific notation, but other than that, um, it's kind of handy. Um, but then what I want else to show you is um, so we're getting only 10 rows here, but sometimes that's even too much. So we can also use a command called show or like a method called show, which will show us only a set number of rows. All right, so instead of the 10, we actually are only gonna show four because for whatever reason, it's simpler to understand. Um, but obviously it's only gonna take the top four, okay, when you ask for it. All right, so as demonstrated with the percents before, we can make those tickets look a little better by actually setting a number formatter. So now we should get kind of the, the, the real number, right? Instead of scientific notation. And whatever it is. So for Avengers, you know, 1.2 billion tickets were sold. That's a lot of tickets. So this kind of all goes into that exploring your data starting to look at you know what what other information do you need um, in order what other data do you need in order to be able to understand what you're trying to build but i wish you would show me the next question um so hopefully we have a question that yeah. So, which of these is an is a numerical attribute, right, uh, versus a categorical attribute? Now, arguably, depends on the school, but arguably, they're all numbers. Uh -huh. And there's one of these, it's a little bit of a trick question. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, click those buttons. All right, moving. So I thought I turned green for you when you made the right answer. So, so the right answer was age, okay? Social security number, social security numbers, uh, you may or may not know this. The first three digits actually indicate uh, uh, where you got the social security number from. Uh, so basically it indicates usually like state or like sub-state. So for example, my social security number starts with a California, okay? Um, then the second two numbers are actually the hospital. And then the last one is uh, like just a counter. So 
this is actually why social security numbers are not supposed to be considered unique because they are ridiculously easy to collide. Uh, and there's actually now a whole mechanism for actually getting rid of collision on security numbers, social security numbers. Um, so even though I wasn't actually born in this country, I was born abroad, but I entered into California. So I have a California looking social security number. Um, but yeah, uh, so there's actually a bunch of information in there. So if you know someone's social security number, you actually know where they're from. Um, then school ID number, I think that's obvious, right? Also not numeric, right? Like there's nothing interesting about the fact that somebody's number is higher or lower than somebody else's. Um, although there can be, so sometimes they are numerically delivered, okay? They just count up. Uh, this is actually, if it's an employee ID number, that's actually very common, but usually that's unreliable. For example, what if like, let's think like an employee, they join the company the, the first two weeks of the company starting, they get an employee ID number of two. Then they leave the company and they come back. So do they still have their two or do they get a new number and which one is the right one? So it's still kind of categorical. So that one's why it's a little weird. The one that I, I would argue is a bit of a trick question is birth date. Because when you use birth date in some situations, it's numerical. And if you use it in other situations, it's categorical, okay? So if you think about it, right, you can do, because that's how you can calculate age, for example, if all you have is birth date. Um, it's also, but on the flip side, if what you're doing is, uh, you know, uh, zodiac signs, um, the birth date is pure categorical in that scenario. All right. So before we talk about the census, let's look a little bit more at the movies. And, oh boy. So what if we wanna know which of the movies are like kind of, we just want the set of data that is about movies that came out between the years of 2000 and 2005. Does anybody have any ideas about how you would do that? We talked about it a little bit, but we haven't done a whole lot of examples of it. Uh, let's start. Let's start with the basics. What's the method you should use on the table to be able to select a certain number of rows? Okay. Anybody? Uh, sorry. Yes, the, the certain number of rows. Uh, but what I want is a specific set of rows, right? Select. Uh, that's what she just said. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, oh, so, yeah. Okay. So, select returns a table of the certain number of rows out of a block. Show just displays those rows out of, out of a certain number out of a block. Um, it's funny. This is why it's like I know my fingers know what I'm doing, but I don't always know it in my brain. Uh, yeah. Where? Okay. So, where is just like select or arguably kind of like show. The closer to select, except that you can specify conditions. Okay. So the MP range. No, so MP range is going to give you an array of numbers between a you know x and y, you know whatever they are. So what we want to do is we want so you could use MP range to kind of feed your where, but it's easy. There's an easier way. So. And I don't think you've seen this yet. But so what I do with where is I give it the label, the column that I want, right? Then I can give it the condition I want to test against. So the example we saw X lectures ago was I was pulling out chocolate out of the ice cream cone table, right? And so what I did was I just put in quotes in here, I put chocolate. But what I can also do is this R object, okay, has a number of different things that hang off of it. So there's like equals, right? Which would be what you might use for uh, like chocolate or something. But this one will do between, so 2000 and 2005. So the thing that can be arguably a little bit annoying 
is this is not actually giving me what I asked for originally. Anybody know why not? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. It's not inclusive on the top end. So the same as everything else, when we say something like between, that's inclusive on the bottom and exclusive on the top. So if we actually wanted what I said, then we need to make this 2006 so that we get 2000 through 2005. Make sense? Do you have a question? All right, so going back to the other example, like the one I kind of just mentioned, you can just use bare numbers too if it's a numerical field. And we can just say, I just want to grab 2002. So I don't need to do anything special, right? I can just give it the condition. Um, but then if I want to, you know, if I like to do extra typing, which you all know, I do not, but it comes in handy sometimes. There is something hanging off this R that is equal to, okay? So you can just do it that way as well. Obviously, I'm going to type that every single time, but it can be handy when this is complex, okay? Oh my goodness, we only 15 minutes left. All right, I love when everything goes poorly, so we run out of time. Um, why is there what? Why is there a decimal in the tickets? So, uh, because okay, so what we did was we did a division, and so the outcome of a division is always a float. Oh, so uh, if I wanted to, I could have passed it, um, because it does not make a whole lot of sense to sell an 83rd of a, of a ticket, but that's why. And basically the reason, like arguably the division should still come out correctly. It should still be just zero. But one of these numbers, whatever we're dividing, oh, here and here, there's probably some loss of information. Okay. So this should have a lot more numbers after this, you would imagine. For example, it's obviously been rounded or cut off to this first digit. The average ticket price, you know, US dollars, right? You know for sure this is probably wrong, right? It's probably been cut off or rounded as well. So, because you did rounding here and rounding here, you get an incorrect, slightly incorrect number here. But for the most part, when you're doing stuff like this, uh, you, you, like, you, you kind of know going in that the number is going to be close to exact. All right, so another thing we can do, and this R method or this R object is super handy. So now what this is going to do is it's going to say, okay, show me all the movies that have, um, well, the column is, you know, the movie um, contains Harry Potter, right? So I know I didn't explain that terribly well, but basically, the, you know, the number one movie for that year was Harry Potter um, and the Deathly Hallows. Um, and sorcerer stone, so we can do partial matching when you know we don't know if uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, but um, going back to the ice cream cones, you know, are there are there flavor? Oh, right, maybe you want to do vanilla and French vanilla, right? You want to combine them, so you would just search for vanilla using containing because containing means it's anywhere in there. The thing to remember though is it's not like individual letters; it's literally the whole thing. Okay. So if you use, does anybody here use Google at all to search the internet sometimes? Um, so if you put something in quotes in the search field, for example, it does the same thing. All right. So here is another new function that can come in handy, which going back to the earlier example, or uh, to the earlier answers, um, instead of using something like select, 
to grab from the middle. Okay, we use tape. Okay, and it basically means the same thing as English word, right? Like grab these ones from wherever. And so what we're going to say is get me the rows that are between two and five, right? So it's going to be row two, row three, row four, and then stop. And so that's kind of how you grab out of the middle. If you know where you want to get it from, that's how you do it. It's just with tape. I would say this is probably the least common mechanism because you normally you're looking for something like Star Wars, right? Or Harry Potter, or you know, the gross that's over a certain amount or things like that. So take while super can be super handy when you need it, is probably one of the least commonly used things. Then let me just see. So I'm going to do like a slide or so on the census, um, but then we'll we'll actually talk about the census data later. So first of all, does everyone here know what the you know here? So that's the outcome. Yeah, but the help. census itself is basically trying to count everyone in the US. Mm -hmm. All right. The reason that's so important to the US is because our constitution dictates that the number of people that you have at the federal level counts is based on the number of people in the country. Okay. Um, and it's not every 10 years, and it's required by the Constitution that we do this. Um, and then it's used to return representation for the House of Representatives, if you're unfamiliar with how the US government works. Um, however, the Census Bureau, which is a always running organization within the US government, estimates it every year. But the impact of it is only is usually only applied. Uh, every 10 years when the real census goes through. Okay. As you might imagine, this causes quite a lot of controversy. Okay. So there is such a thing in the US and in every country actually, but we have a specific name for it, but someone called an undocumented alien. Okay. So does that person get counted in the US census? And this was a big deal in the most recent census, which was 2020, right? Yeah, I'm like <laughs> blanking on the year. Um, and it was a very big political deal, okay, about whether or not we count people um, as part of our representative Congress uh, when, if they're not U.S. citizens or not documented or whatever. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave you with that of, yeah. One next part, next time, answer the should those people be counted or not counted when you're talking about building your federal government? Thanks, everybody. Don't forget to do the homework. Yeah.